here to meet with you. I'm here to meet with you. Come and meet with me. Well, I'm here to find you. Reveal yourself to me as I wait. You make me strong as I long. Draw me to your arms as I stand and sing your praise. You come, you come, and you fill this place. I'm here to meet with you. Come and meet with me, for I'm here to find you, reveal yourself to me. As I wait, you make me strong, as I long, draw me to your arms, as I stand and sing your praise you come you come and you fill this place won't you come won't you come and fill this place you're calling me to lay aside Calling me to lay aside the worries of my day to Quiet down my busy mind and find a hiding place Worthy You are worthy busy mind and find a hiding place worthy you are worthy I open up my heart I open up my heart and let my spirit worship yours I open up my mouth and let the song of praise come forth worthy Worthy, you are worthy. Worthy, you are worthy. Worthy, you are worthy. Amen. 
And good morning again, and welcome to the New Heights Worship Service. My name is Katie. I'm one of the youth pastors on staff. As you take your seats this morning, if you would take a second, just turn to those around you, especially if you don't know them, introduce yourself and share the peace of Christ with one another today. We are so glad that each of you are here to join us in worship this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Um, Hopefully each of you got a bulletin as you came in. On that is our Connect card. We hope that you'll take a second throughout the service to fill that out, especially if you're a guest and you're visiting with us today. We would love to know that you're here, know a little bit about you. And then on the back of that, there's opportunities to sign up for exciting things that are going on in the life of the church. So if you will just take a second throughout the service, you can fill that out and then drop it in the offering plate later in the service. Also, a couple of announcements about things that are going on in the life of the church that we want to make sure you know about. Next Sunday is a very big Sunday for us here at PH. It's Pack the House Sunday. Uh, Just like we need a little bit of a kick to get in back to school mode, um, we also need a a little bit of a kick sometimes to get into back to church mode. Um, So we're starting off a new sermon series. We'll be having a book signing for our PHUMC Centennial book. And um, we really want everyone in the congregation and the community to make an effort um, to come back to church, to invite a friend that you maybe haven't seen in a while or somebody um, in your in your circle at work, school, that you know doesn't have a church community. We hope that you'll take this Sunday as, as a little extra push to just get back into the, into the habit, into the attitude of coming to worship. Um, also want to let you know, on September 11th, we'll be hosting a special event called Being Christian in a Multi-Faith World. Um, Dr. John Sanders will be here, and we'll just be talking about how to dialogue and how to be in community with people of other faiths. Um, and so as we celebrate the anniversary of September 11th, we hope that you'll come and be a part of that very important discussion. Discussion. Also want to let you know that the church will be closed um, this afternoon after this service and then again tomorrow in observance of Labor Day. Um, and lastly, that next Saturday is the first Razorback game here in Little Rock. Um, and every hog game here in Little Rock, uh, we park cars here at the church. And all the money that is raised goes towards supporting youth missions. So if you're planning on coming to tailgate or to go to the game next weekend, or if you know people that are, we uh, hope that you will encourage them to come park here and support a good cause. So as we enter this time of worship together, would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming into your presence this morning to worship you. And God, we declare that you are worthy of all of our praise and all the honor and all the glory. So we pray that as we worship you this day, that you would come and move in our hearts and move in this place, that you would open our minds and our ears and our lives to what it is that you have for us this day. We thank you, God, for your love and your grace that covers us. We ask all of this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord this day. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm so glad to get to be with you all. I'm Aubrietta Jones. If we have not yet had a chance to meet, I'm one of the associate pastors here at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, and I am here to talk to you today about the quest for contentment. Um, Contentment is one of those words in our society that is slowly starting to lose its meaning. The meaning, the way we understand that word, is becoming thinner, shallower, all the time. Let me kind of explain what I mean by that. Um, I decided to Google the phrase quest for contentment just to come up, see what, see what uh, was on the internet about this, and 
I am happy to tell you that I found the secret for achieving contentment right there on the internet. There's a young lady that has a blog, uh, and uh, she has found contentment, meaning that she has gotten married, and she is writing this blog for all the other ladies that have not yet found contentment, meaning all the women who are not married. And uh, she feels that she has a lot of wisdom to share. She's been married about a month or something when she started the blog. And so she wants to make sure that all the young ladies find contentment, i.e., get married. Now, just so you all understand what contentment uh, is supposed to mean, contentment is supposed to be peace, serenity, satisfaction, fulfillment. Um, and uh, that's, that's what it's supposed to mean. Okay, so... I'm thinking about marriage, and I'm thinking about contentment. And I am a happily married woman, but I would have to say that I think about the only way that someone would think that marriage automatically leads to a sense of contentment is if they haven't been married very long. Um, uh, if you're married, you know that there are financial anxieties, there are anxieties about judgment calls on where spouses don't really agree, there are a variety of reasons that marriage doesn't necessarily automatically bring satisfaction, fulfillment, serenity, peace, all the things we associate with, <clears throat> with contentment. So the thing I did notice, though, is that it does seem like there's kind of this trend that we believe that contentment is dependent on our circumstances. I'll show you some artwork that I found about contentment because I, I always like to do that, too, is kind of see how that... How that uh, a phrase or a word that I'm using in my sermon is portrayed in a visual form. We find that contentment is a little girl asleep with her kitty cat under a blanket. Contentment is a lady reading in a garden, pretty nice looking garden, and she's got a bird on her head. Now, I would have to say that for me, that would not raise my level of peace, serenity, or satisfaction. I would actually be kind of nervous that I might need to wash my hair soon, but she seems to be okay with it, so that's contentment. And then there is, there are a variety of uh, beautiful vistas, vacation spots. Apparently that is contentment too. So I'm looking at these images and what they tell me is that contentment is based on leisure. Implicitly, contentment is based on wealth. You know, this is a beautiful, beautiful scene. And then you consider the woman sitting in the garden and uh, she has, she's a very comfortable environment to be in. So there's, there's that element too. The interesting thing, if you look at all the images of contentment on the internet, or most of them, as many as you can find, contentment seems to be almost completely considered to be a feminine quality. There are very few contented men, so uh, you guys can just kind of unplug for the rest of the sermon, uh, because according to the internet, men don't get to be content. Contentment is a feminine thing, and I don't know what that means, except I would think that that may be related to some sexism, and we don't view contentment as being a very... Uh, a very positive quality in a strong person being, meaning that we see men as being strong and women as not being strong. That would be my guess what that means uh, in terms of our definition, our understanding of contentment as there's a little sexism there. But um, comparing these images to the environment in which the man lived who wrote the passage of scripture that we read today is a stark contrast. Because Paul, the apostle, the church planter and evangelist from the early life of the church, he was in jail when he wrote the passage that we read today. He did not have a life of leisure. He had never had a life of leisure. He worked very hard. He had a controversial faith position that made him an outcast in the Jewish community of his day and also made him suspect by the Greek world in which they lived. He was jailed for his faith. And uh, not that jail or prison is ever a pleasant place, but it's not like it is today. In the passage that Katie read for us, it talks about the people reviving their concern for him. They sent things for him, and they sent someone to the town to come and visit him uh, to support him in his imprisonment because it was such a terrible, terrible experience, and their basic needs were not even met. The, it was possible for a prisoner to be flogged without too much due process or um, there was, it was just a terrible, terrible experience. It probably wasn't unusual for people to die in prison. Um, 
of, of causes that might have been prevented elsewhere. This is the person who said, I have learned to be content in whatever situation. This is the person that is teaching us about contentment. Clearly, we have a lot to learn. The truth is, contentment is well on its way to becoming one of those greeting card gift shop kind of words. Um, if you don't know what I mean, you walk into a Hallmark or any kind of a gift shop, and you're going to find these flowery wall hangings and plaques. And there's going to be some beautiful picture on there, smiling people maybe. A lot of times there's flowers or a waterfall or something like that. And there's going to be these really important Christian words on those offerings. There's going to be some really deep Christian concepts there. And the picture is really going to have nothing to do with the true meaning behind those concepts. And the reason that those, those items sell there may be some people that purchase those that understand the meaning of those words and they want those words posted in their home or their office so they remember what, they, what they're supposed to be about as a Christian. But most people buy them because they don't know what the words mean. And contentment is about to become one of those words. It's about to be one of those words that we only see in flowery handwriting on a wall plaque or a wall hanging or a greeting card in a store. A feel-good word. This passage that we're looking at today is riddled with feel-good words that have a deeper, fuller meaning than what you can find uh, when you see them explained and described today in pop Christian culture and in uh, the uh, Christian culture of acquisition, uh, where that being a Christian means we buy all the right stuff, the pretty stuff that goes in our house that kind of gives that tacit message that we are believers so when we go on our quest for contentment today, I don't want us to just think about our own lives at first. I want us to also think about what does the word contentment really mean? Do we know what it is we're even looking for? And then I want us to also think about what it is we're doing in our own lives to increase our sense of contentment, of peace, serenity, fulfillment, satisfaction. The word that Paul uses that, he tr that is translated to contentment is ought our case. It means achieving self-sufficiency, peace, serenity, and satisfaction, independent of all things and all people. So what Paul is talking about is something that is not at all based on situation, but the other thing that's interesting about it is that it is something that is a choice and a practice that we have to learn. Um, it, it is a phrase and a concept that is borrowed from a philosophy of Paul's day. Paul was very good at this, uh, going to the world around him and finding a philosophy that people might know and sort of retooling it a little bit, reshaping it a little bit so that it would more, more fully enrich the Christian faith. This concept, ought our case, this type of self-sufficiency of not being in need or in want, is from the Stoic philosophy of life. The philosophy that taught that if you really wanted to be happy and fulfilled, you needed to purge yourself of all desire, all need, all dependence on anyone or anything. And so you would live a very Spartan life, a very uh, pared-down life with very few possessions, you would also live a life with very few attachments to other people because the goal to become satisfied in this life was to be emptied of anything that could call upon your love and your need to have it in your life. How does that sound for you as a nice cheery way to live? There may be a reason that this is not the overriding philosophy of the world in which we live today. It sounds a little barren. It sounds a little dry. And we know this is not how Paul lived because he's writing to a community that he dearly loved. If you read Paul's letter to the Philippians, um, you'll find that it is, it is filled with his deep love for these people. He's praying for them. He's praying for all of the people that he has led to faith in Christ. And... He is filled with concern for them. He's happy to see them. 
he has all those relationships now materially he has a pretty spare life but he has all those relationships and so that's a little bit different and so what Paul is doing when he's talking about contentment he's saying he has achieved this feeling of self-sufficiency and peace and serenity and all the while he's been able to maintain those relationships and to keep close to people uh, in an emotional sense in his life and he's claiming something that according to the stoic philosophy might not really be fully possible so we have to find out how is it that paul achieves contentment serenity and peace satisfaction well-being in his circumstance where he is so tied to other people and where he knows that the persecution he's facing in jail the persecution he's faced for his entire ministry as a follower of jesus christ is something that anyone he loves and cares about in the church is liable to face as well because all the christians at this time there was growing danger for the christians as they became more and more separate from the jewish community but also seen possibly as a threat to uh, Greek sovereignty and this kind of thing uh, as they begin to claim Jesus Christ as Lord instead of Caesar as Lord uh, it feels like there's this competing loyalty uh, and and there's there's more and more tension about this these people are gonna face terrible things because of their faith and he loves them how does he find self-sufficiency how does he find peace and serenity in the midst of that reality let alone the things he's suffering himself. And so that's what he's really talking about. And um, as I said, he, he believes this is a choice. And he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable or noble, whatever is just, pure, or lovely, whatever is commendable or admirable, if there's anything excellent, anything that's praiseworthy, this is what you think about. It's a choice that you think about these things. You condition yourself to be a person who is going to be content. Now, this is one of those verses, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. This is one of those verses in danger of ending up on the pretty wall plaque, okay? So um, let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary here and unpack the richness of this. this is, if you don't understand any of the background of it and any of the true meaning of the words, the deepest meaning of these words, it's still, I think, powerful, but it's even better when you understand what Paul is trying to get at. This word that is described as honorable um, or admirable, depending on your translation, of whatever is honorable, think about that. That word is actually referring to something a little different. It's referring to what is spiritually meaty, what is spiritually deep, what is significant. In other words, think about things that have a little substance to them. Don't just think about things that are basically junk food for the brain. I don't know about you, but if I turn on my television for too long these days, I feel like I'm just a little bit dumber by the time I've watched three commercials. You know, a few years back, there was a commercial. I remember seeing this. It was a skincare company, uh, one of the makeup companies, and they had this this uh, sunscreen makeup that they were advertising and the uh, the uh, slogan for this product was worship your skin have you ever thought about something stupider to worship than your own skin we even have little phrases in our language uh, uh, you save my skin you, you know what I'm saying like like why would anyone, if you take that literally, why would anyone worship their own skin? What a ridiculous notion. But these little catchphrases that come up in the advertising world, uh, some of the things that happen on the television shows, ridiculous, stupid choices people make, and you're yelling at the television that they shouldn't make this choice, and it's not something you would want to do. And we end up seeing things and seeing things, if we have children, we end up uh, exposing them to things that we would never want them to be exposed to. It's just the nature of the world we live in with the media present in our lives at all times, with television present in our lives at all times, it's really easy to fill our minds with junk. And Paul is saying, to be content, you've got to find a little bit more substance. Think about some things that are spiritually meaty and significant. Figure out how to get more of that in your life, whether it's reading a devotional or reading some books, whether it's um, being part of a Bible study or something of that sort. Think about some things that are meaty. Think about some things that matter. 
Think about things that are just or right. Think about things that are pure. Think about things that are lovely. Lovely is another one of those words we don't really understand anymore. Lovely is, uh, it's kind of a thinned out word, and we think about physical attractiveness or whatever is picturesque. Really, in this passage, the word they translate as lovely, what they actually mean is think about something that invokes love. That's a little different, isn't it? Think about something that invokes love. Think about something that makes you a more loving person, that makes another person a more loving person. Concentrate on that. That's a pretty deep idea from someone who is in a jail where that the jailers have the right to just beat them. Think about what would make you a more loving person. And Paul is saying in this passage, I am thinking about things that will make me a more loving person. Paul tells us to think about what is commendable or what is admirable. And what that really means is to think of something that is worth reporting to other people, something that is worthy to be passed on. How much do we say and hear that is not, in fact, worthy to be passed on? The petty complaints of the day, the gossip, the venting of frustrations where that no constructive solution will be found in the conversation, and we know that going in. How much we share is not actually admirable, commendable, even newsworthy in any kind of positive sense. Paul is talking to a community here. He's not just saying you need to find this yourself. He's saying this is in your community. You need to pass on things that are good. You need to pass on things that are worthy of sharing. You need to strengthen one another. That's the tacit meaning of that recommendation. And as somebody who loves people and who loves the communities he has started, Paul believes in that. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know that we're the people that are helping others have deeper contentment in their life because of the things we say to other people? So we're supposed to think about what is commendable and worthy to pass on to others. What's excellent and anything that's worthy of praise. This is what we're supposed to be thinking about. Now, before you think that this is a, some kind of a positive thinking exercise and that if you just think it, it will happen uh, type, of, type of positive visualization, there's a little more to it than that because if we think about these things, we actually make ourselves a person who is more open to the spirit of the God of peace. That's what Paul says, that if we think about these things, that the God of peace will be with us. He will be with us. We will not necessarily in the short term be with him somewhere else. He will be with us in our situation. Now that's a really important distinction too. Uh, at an earlier point in the, in the uh, uh, book we're reading today in Philippians, there is a point where Paul talks about the power of prayer, and he says, you know, if you, if you pray with requests and also thanking God that uh, God will guard your hearts with this peace that passes understanding. And that's an important thing to know, that when we practice things that put us in God's presence, that put God in in our lives and put an awareness of God in our lives, we're with the God of peace. The God of peace, this phrase is used five times in scripture. It's used once as a benediction. It's used in this passage and the three other times that this phrase is used. Talk about a God that has done something in the world or is doing something in response to what is going on in the world rather than taking people out of it. It talks about the God that uh, brought Jesus Christ into the world and raised Jesus Christ from the evil of death. It talks about the God that will make us holy, will make us better people if we pray and pursue that in the midst of this flawed world in which we live. And it talks about the God that will help us to win the battle and to get through the challenges of this life. 
Never once does it talk about a God that simply plucks us out of our situation and puts us somewhere that is more pleasant. And I can't tell you how important I think that is for Christians to know and to understand that because that is a bill of goods that has been sold to Christians and that Christians have been selling to one another for entirely too long. I want to be clear at this point. I believe in miracles and in the power of prayer. And I pray for healings. I pray for miracle connections between people. I believe in miracles. But I also believe that many times God leaves us in the difficult situations we are in with all the hardships that we have and that the way the God of peace works is to help us bear up under those situations. And there's a lot of people that do not teach that today. If we're not careful, we end up teaching our own children that all they have to do is pray and God, like some kind of cosmic gumball machine, will spit out the request, the answer to their prayer exactly as they expected to find it. And we're setting our kids up for a faith crisis. We really are. Most faith crises that Christians face have to do with not understanding this point that God does not always take us out of even the most terrible, horrible situations. We believe it in theory until we're in the midst of it, and sometimes we just sort of have a breaking point where we really believe if it gets this bad, God will do something different, and for whatever reason, that is not what happens. I remember a few years ago, I was talking to a woman who had been converted to Christianity as a grown-up, and she had raised her children in the church, and she had gone to several churches where they had taught that if you raise your children in church, they never mess up. If you raise your children in church, they never get in trouble. If you raise your children in church, they don't even go through the teenage rebellion years. Well, I mean, sometimes that happens. But a lot of times there are some bumps along the way, aren't there, parents? A lot of times there's a few. And she was really mad because she felt like God had kind of let her down because her kids were going through some very typical teenage rebellion things. Nothing too bad, but they were doing some stuff that was really a heartache to her and her to she and her husband, and she, she was just stressed out about it. You know, she had every right to be angry. Not at God, though, but at all those churches and all those pastors who had taught her that when very likely by years of experience they had to have known that wasn't quite the case, and it just kind of drove up the numbers in the congregations that they pastored. If we read the scriptures, we know that some of the most faithful followers of Jesus Christ ended up being martyred for Christ rather than delivered from their pain and anguish in this world. God does not always get us out of those tough situations, but what he does is something that is both more painful for us and more powerful for us, he helps us get through it. He helps make us stronger. He gives us something to tell others about how God can be faithful in times of difficulty. There's a well-known Bible teacher of the day, and she makes the statement that if you are a Christian, your life was meant to be a great story. And great stories are not boring and they are never easy to live through but they're still great stories that's what God wants to give you God wants to show you what you can be and what you can do and what you can become in those most difficult situations in your life and so I have to ask you today what are you going to do when you find yourselves in the jail cells of this existence. Are you really seeking contentment? Are you really trying to do the things that put yourself uh, into a place where that God can come and dwell with you in your life every day and you can be aware of that? Or are you just sort of hoping that contentment will fall upon you as if you just suddenly won the lottery? Are you one of those people that hopes that you'll just meet a nicer person than you have met before and you'll marry that person and life will suddenly become easy? Are you one of those people that hopes that your job will just suddenly change 
and will not be hard again. I have to confess, brothers and sisters, that there are probably ways in which I am one of those people. I really made fun of that young woman at the beginning of the message today. I probably shouldn't have done that because she thinks contentment is found in marriage. And whether I've admitted it to myself or not, or whether I've even uncovered it, subconsciously, I probably think contentment is found somewhere else. Or there's a line beyond which in my life that I cannot be content any further. And you probably have that line too. But what Paul said was, I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. His relationship with God is what made it possible for him to face the challenges of this life. There's a man named Erwin McManus. He's a pastor of a church called the Mosaic Church. And I really like Erwin McManus. I really like a lot of his books, and I enjoy reading them. And one of the things I remember him saying one time when I was at a conference and got to hear him speak is that his son had gone to a church camp, and it happened to be a church camp of a particular persuasion, a particular view. Anyway, instead of telling ghost stories at camp, which he was sure, you know, Christian kids didn't tell ghost stories, they told demon stories. <laughs> And so his kid came back afraid of things that go bump in the night, just as sure as if he had gone to any other kind of camp uh, because he had gone with these uh, particularly, uh, I don't know if you'd say conservative, but people of a particular viewpoint. And he still came back with all the same fears and all the same worries and all the same scary stories that kids would come back from any other camp. And he said, Dad, I want you to pray that the demons don't get me. And he said, I am not going to pray that those demons don't get you. Dad, come on! He said, I am going to pray that God makes you so scary that when the demons see you, they want to run. And he's like, oh, that's pretty cool, Dad. I want you to do that. In our lives, the tragedies don't exactly run. But in the power of God and with the help of our Christian community, we can run off some of the depression and some of the despair, some of the doubt. And hopefully we can overcome some of those crises by walking through them in faith. That's what God has to offer. That's what the God of peace has to offer you and me. And so in our quest for contentment, I hope and pray that all of us will learn to, to live through Christ and to find that he is, in fact, the greatest source of strength and power we can ever know in our lives, that we may, too, find that serenity, that peace, fulfillment, and satisfaction and have a life that is contented and blessed because of the goodness of God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being faithful in the midst of the hardships of this life. We thank you for being faithful in the storms. And we pray, God, that in those times when it feels as if we are overcoming, and in the times when we feel as if we are being overcome, that you would shine your faithfulness, that you would help us to be strengthened by your great love, by the power of Christ in us, with the assurance that you are with us every step of the way, and that you can do something amazing and beautiful through the hardships we suffer. In the name of Christ the Lord we pray. Amen. On the night in which Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this and remember me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, 
he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. Let us pray. Oh God, we do remember and we give thanks. We remember the ways that Jesus walked among us and taught the miracles and the healings that he offered to show your love to the world, to make people whole. We remember his obedience in love and in service, even to death on a cross. And we remember and look forward to the reality of the resurrection. We pray, O oh God, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on the gift of the bread and the cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and we might be for the world the body of Jesus, alive and active, making a difference for others to your glory. We pray you would unite us in service to all we meet until the day of Christ's glorious return when we are invited to a banquet that never ends. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, here in this holy community of faith that you have created, we offer you all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. I would invite you to join together in the prayer that our Lord taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would the servers please come forward? table is set. As the ushers come forward, you may, uh, you may come as directed. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. Just as Just as Just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. 
Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just Just as I am, Lord, thou tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting fears within, without, O oh, Lamb of God, I come, I As the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings this morning, would you join me in prayer? Holy God, we thank you that you are a God of peace. And we confess this day, God, that it is often so much easier to spend our time thinking on the things that we lack, the things that we wish that we had or the things that we wish that we were. But God, help us to remember this day that we could spend eternity thinking on good things thinking on things that are commendable, that are lovely, that are pure. And God, help us to remember this day that when we spend our time thinking on those things we cultivate in ourselves, you help us to cultivate in ourselves an attitude of praise and thanksgiving and of gratefulness. So out of that sense of gratefulness, we give this day, O oh God, of our tithes and our offerings. And we pray the gifts that we give, that you would take them, Lord, and that you would use them for the glory and the furthering of your kingdom. We pray that they would be used both in this place and throughout the world, sharing the love and the grace that you have so freely given to us with everyone that we meet. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, your Son, and our Christ. Amen. We bow our hearts. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean idols. hands. Give us clean hands. And give us pure to another so give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another we bow our hearts your face 
Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. So give us clean hands. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. So give us clean hands and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Would you please stand and sing? God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives All fear is gone because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living just because He lives How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because He lives. And life is worth the living just because He lives. Friends, before I offer the benediction today, I want to tell you just a little bit more about Pack the House Sunday. I really hope that all of you well, think about friends that you have that have attended here before, maybe have kind of gotten out of the habit of coming, or friends that have gotten out of the habit of attending church anywhere. It's easy for that to happen. You know, you miss two or three Sundays, and nobody wants to bug you because they just think you were out of town, and it turns out you were sick, and nobody calls you, and you don't go back again. It happens all the time. Or you just get out of the habit because your life changes, and, and it's hard to get there for maybe a couple years when you have a kid or something like that, and then you're able to go again and nobody invites you back. I want you to invite your friends back. I have some cards that can be mailed as postcards. If you uh, know of someone that you'd like to drop a note in the mail or if you want to give them a call, do it however you want to do it. But I will have these postcards up front and I hope you will take one if you know of someone 
that uh, right now does not have a church home where they attend, and let's invite them to come and be a part of this family of faith where that they can meet the God of peace and get the support and the strength that they need in the challenging times of their lives. Hear the benediction. May the God of peace who offers the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And life is worth the living just because he lives.